Hi, I'm Angela and welcome. This video and podcast today is all about communication within a community. So due to this virus situation, some of us are experiencing new things that we've not faced in our lifetime, but collectively we're also facing things that we haven't gone through as a planet, as a country, as a community, on a smaller level, as a family. So communication is key in how we move forward and group communication in particular. I've mentioned before that I'm addressing the difference between moving from one age to the next and a lot of people have talked about this situation we're in collectively as the end of one way of living and the beginning of a new way of living. It's just more dramatic, this shift between one era and the next. And it needs to be dramatic because as a community, as a collective, or more particularly as a community, as different communities within a larger community of the planet or the globe or the, of the human community, we're looking at how do we move forward. So the, today as I look at that role of communication, it's a very big piece about how we love. And this love oracle is about how we love. How do we do that? I'm going to refer to some neuroscience information from, um, I've just met him. He's an interesting fellow, Daisha Keltner, and I'm probably saying his name wrong. And I'll put the link in the description for one of his videos. Daisha Keltner is a neuroscientist researcher and he sees how compassion is actually neurologically wired into us. His research is about that. And he looks at how we communicate that through our voice. We, he's found that compassion in his research and others that he works with, compassion is not communicated through the face so clearly. It's communicated more, communicated more through our sounds, like, oh, our voice, our tone is communicated through touch more clearly. So the senses that we have are very important in how we communicate and because a large part of the population is isolated at the moment. We're, we're missing human touch. We still have the ability to connect through the vibration of sound. And unfortunately, a lot of people are communicating through text and words or print uh, messaging. And also last video or last podcast, I talked about the man-made media, which uses verbal communication through text and through news, relationship of news, relating of news through words, video or auditory words, which isn't always going to have the element of compassion in, in the tone of how they relate the news. So the news typically is expected to be a dispassionate relaying of information. It's not supposed to be eliciting eliciting compassion or it's not supposed to be sharing compassion in the news. It's supposed to be data-based, but as we know, a lot of news is flavoured by the perception of that news or the way the news is collected. And it's also the perception of the news supposed to be fact-based, not opinion-based. So if we're going to look at communication in building a community and in particular I'm looking at healing a community. Why would we want to heal a community? What's wrong with the community? <laughs> Why would a, heal a community need healing? There's nothing wrong with our community, is there? <laughs> well, if you look at the news or if you look at your own perception of community, what is that right now? Do you have perceptions about your community that it's somehow flawed, that it's troublesome, that it's divided, that it's stupid or members or groups in your community are stupid? Do you have a perception that you don't like community? Or are you experiencing in isolation that you miss aspects of your community, like going down to the corner 
shop or going down to get a coffee or going down to just check out the action in your local neighbourhood? Do you miss that? Do you crave contact? So that this isolation period for us is a really great opportunity to see what we want from our community that's not about you. It's about contact or connection. And that's key because we've been put in isolation for reasons not just to control a virus but to collectively look at how we're in our community, things have not gone well and how we want to change them. If you're looking in particular at the shift from the Piscean Age to the Aquarian Age, Piscean Age represented by a lot of splitting of different groups into different tribes or different beliefs. The Aquarian Age is represented idealistically as a coming together of those different groups, no matter what your belief or your perception of reality is. And from the Piscean way of thinking, that's going to be difficult if we have different groups in our community that think differently. The old way of thinking is that that's impossible because you think that, we think this, that other group thinks this. It's not possible for all these different ways of thinking to come together. However, what the um, neuroscientist Daisha Keltner is saying is that historically, evolutionary, we have a lot of research, modern research and, and even from Darwin, evidence that people did come together over thousands of years. We have evidence. Even Darwin is saying that survival of groups was dependent on, on, Darwin says, sympathy with others. Simpatico, you say in Italian. Simpatico in Italian is not sympathy. But Darwin's use of the word sympathy is not feeling sorry for people. It's actually about having a resonance with others. Simpatico is like you get a good feeling in Italian. So that's the context that Darwin's using when he says sympathy. And what Deshna is saying in his research and other, Desha, sorry, I'm getting his name wrong. <laughs> uh, he, he's saying, as long with other researchers, is that kindness has had made, made the species more successful. So from Darwin's own research, from other researchers, that when a group or a tribe is more harmonious, more kind, they have more offspring and they are more successful and their offspring are more successful. They go on to create more babies and they, those babies survive better. So it's pretty, it's pretty natural. The other interesting thing Daisha says is that compassion is not only in the prefrontal cortex. So a lot of neuroscientists are saying that through breathing, um, meditation and spiritual practices, you activate the prefrontal cortex and that's where you get higher emotions like compassion or forethought, thinking positively, thinking outside the box, thinking about how to bring two different things together. How a basic human compassion or empathy or kindness is also hardwired in the mammalian brain. So that's the, the research he's been exploring and check him out if you're interested in that evolutionary science perspective of how we are wired to be kind. It's within us. It's innate. So if it's innate in us, if we are naturally kind, if that's in, innate in us, this separation we may perceive in our community is here for an important reason, to get us to wake up. Why are we seeing all this difference of opinion and differences in the community and people expressing their dissent? We could say they're just being selfish. We could say that, yeah. But why is it happening at this time as we're shifting from one world to a new world or a new way of being in community? on a very practical level after we come out of isolation, how are we going to do touch? How are we going to take a massage? How are you going to have someone sitting close to someone else? They're very practical things and they're important 
practical things that we can't avoid. Like normally when we were talking about kindness before the virus, we'd say be nice to people because kindness begets kindness. It's a nice thought, isn't it? But with the virus, we can't escape how you're actually going to be socially positioned physically. That's incredible opportunity. Why is this happening? Why are we getting this opportunity to think about how are we going to be physically in community and how will we touch when we know that we want touch but we're not going to shake hands. But beyond shaking hands, beyond even just respecting and giving someone a nod, we want to interact physically. We want to have contact. It's wired into us. And we also want to have community and kindness in community. It's wired into us. So I put to you that the reason that this is coming up now is to really question your perceptions about community. Collectively, we have to think about if we are going to be with people we don't like, we don't agree with, we may have opposing views to, how do we actually do that? And the only way forward, which has been said by a lot of people but perhaps misunderstood for thousands of years, is by accepting difference. You don't have to like people. You don't have to agree with them. But eventually, if you're going to live with them, you have to accept. And that can be really hard if our communication is stripped down to texting over social media, watching Twitter, listening to headlines that try to escalate drama and increase your emotions and your negative perceptions about community or about certain groups in the community. So also access to resources or lack of access to resources triggers innate sense of being deprived of resources, which was triggered in ancient communities from the dawn of time, all communities from the dawn of time. When access to resources is limited, our primitive brain, fight and flight brain or fear of not having access to resources gets triggered. However, in all tribal societies, humans who came together and worked together were better at getting access to resources. So keep in mind it's hardwired in us to know that, yes, you can go into fear of access to resources or even just access to your own right to be who you are. But when we came together, we solved that problem. We've got a lot of DNA memory of that. We've got living history memory of that for some of us. For others of us who are younger, you might just have been <laughs> rudely shocked by this isolation period and being deprived of some things that you thought you were entitled to. And that's good too because you're seeing that, well, life's not always going to be how I think it is and that's important for this time as a community. So healing for a community comes when we look at our perceptions about community, our old, outdated views of community that are not able to resolve conflict, not able to accept people who are different to you. When you just go, well, for thousands of years, people have not liked each other in different tribes and they just worked it out through conflict. Conflict is inherent to our tribal homo sapien human history. So we just resolve things through conflict. Sometimes it was bad conflict, war. Sometimes it was verbal conflict. And sometimes, as we see now on the social media, it's proliferating negative communication. So we have to really be aware if we want to create a new image of community and if we want to come together, that some healing about old perceptions about community might be required. So what do I mean by healing about those perceptions? It's really simple. It's just becoming aware of where you might have personally a gripe about community. I'm going to use my gripe. <laughs> so my old gripe comes from some of my uh, family community, not my only my immediate family but my extended one, about not being heard. So when I grew up in my community, I wasn't heard. I was the youngest out of a long line of other relatives. I was a little kid and I was just considered the little kid. 
So I grew up with a lot of gripes about not being heard. And if I spoke up, no one really listened, which is pretty normal because I was a little kid. And that has persisted in my relationships in other communities. If When I was an adult, I'd still go to a community and I'd keep on reliving this fear of not being heard. Or even if I spoke up, it would be misunderstood or just belittled and washed away. So that is how I began to watch my own relationship to my role in community. How can I then start to value my own communication or, or even just communicate in spite of feeling like a fear of not being understood? Just do it, basically. And that's how I got over it, just by doing, doing, doing. Believe me, it took a lot of doing because <laughs> when you get any beliefs about how you are perceived in a community from very early on in your life, it just tends to be wired into the emotional brain and gets replayed and replayed until you tripwire that emotional brain, until you see the emotional brain operating as an adult and go, that's so old, I don't want to do that anymore. So that's how I've worked personally on my own concerns, perceptions, fears, beliefs about my role in the community. And it's important to keep doing that if I see an old thought come up about why should I bother sharing my voice in the community or expressing what I need in the community. This is a simple way to start looking at your own perceptions about community. And the last podcast video I put on about world news and our perceptions about the world. And if you're watching the world news or the news about this virus and you have certain perceptions, they're also good examples of your beliefs about community, about the value of other communities, about the wrongness or the rightness of other communities. You can have those perceptions, but the question to ask then is, then how do I relate to that community in harmony or in harmlessness? How do I connect to them without hurting them? I might not like them. You don't have to like them. No one's saying that you have to love everybody. Well, you can love them without liking them, basically. You can love people just by saying, you know what, don't really appreciate you, but, hey, you're just another human being like me and you deserve to be here on the planet because you were born, and that's a human gift. It's not a right. I don't believe in rights sometimes. I believe in gifts. If, if somebody is born, they have a gift of life, and that's given. There's no question about whether they have rights to be respect it's a gift it's a given and it's something that I find interesting that humans have to come up with a bill of rights or a human rights because we actually don't understand how life is inherently giving us that level of being equal to each other so humans then created human rights and this is our way of relating unfortunately in our world as we're shifting from an age where we did not respect the life of other people. We're learning in this pandemic survival situation and coming back to socialising or community in relationship, physical relationship versus being virtually connecting. We're learning how to respect life and it will be through conflict. It's not going to be like everybody's kumbaya and saying, oh, isn't that great? We're just all going to get along with each other. We won't. We never have. The difference that can happen now, if you start to look at your own perceptions, fears, beliefs about your role in community, is that you can bring awareness to your judgments, your criticisms about others and simply stop doing it and say, well, I don't really like them. Okay, how am I going to get on with them? It's a simple question. I had lots of people around me who I didn't like, but the way that I actually got on with them was work out, ask myself that question. It was a survival question for me because I was an inhibited child growing up and I had to work out, okay, I don't like this person. How am I going to get on with them? And I used comedy I used other aspects of my personality to do that. But from learning how to get on with them, what I realised was I didn't have to like them. I could learn how to, to get on with someone without liking them. 
And then sometimes, as I learned recently in my hospital experience, there was a couple of people in the hospital that I didn't quite like intuitively, just reactively, not intuitively, reactively. I'd have an experience with someone like, oh, I don't like you. And I was extremely vulnerable because I was quite sick. But then I started to talk and make jokes or just get curious. And suddenly this person became more likable, which sort of threw me because at that time when I was sick, I wasn't really being aware of what I was doing. I was just responding and reacting. And my reactions, if I didn't like someone, I'd go into survival mode and I'd think, how am I going to get through this situation? Because I'm extremely vulnerable and I need help. So I'd just start chatting. My family liked to talk. <laughs> that was one good thing about a family that communicates a lot. We like to talk. So I'd talk and then the person would shift. And suddenly I found out there were likeable aspects about them. In fact, I did like them. I just didn't like the way they behaved or responded to me when they walked into the room. And from that, I discovered a really great survival tool. I realised that even in the most vulnerable of situations, I didn't really have access to my own resources. I couldn't think straight. I, I couldn't get myself to the bathroom. I couldn't move. I saw how I could use language to positively make a bridge connection with someone who I didn't like or was scared of actually or fearful that they might hurt me. And 98% uh, of the time it worked. There were a few examples it didn't. And I'm going to talk about those at some point because conflict itself is extremely important to work out what is our nature, how do we come together in spite of difference and because of difference. And if you are curious about more topics around conflict, I'd like to hear what are the struggles, particular struggles that you face when you're trying to communicate in conflict? A lot of uh, what the science has been revealing is that there are three responses based on our fear and flight response system. Some of us shut down in conflict. Some of us go into paralysis, which is the freeze response, and we just don't know what to say. And uh, you can tell I've, I've got that one down. That's <laughs> how so I used to respond a lot. I just freeze and play possum. And then some of us are uh, attack or uh, fight. We go into a verbal attack. We respond quickly and it flares out of us quickly. And that's wired in all of us. Um, some of you may not like aggression, so you might repress the aggression and it comes out later somewhere <laughs> and that's okay. But be aware that if you respond in any of those three ways, somewhere later in your life or at different points in your life, you will have to experience what a fight response is, even if you don't like it. It will come. You just don't need to do it at, at any particular point, but you need to understand that aspect of your nature because it's inside of you. And when we work in community, that's what we're resolving. We're learning how to heal perhaps judgments about conflict. We're learning how to do differences, how to come together in difference without war because none of us want to go to war and the pandemic is a great way to experience, well, if we're going to live together, how are we going to do that? It's a really great way instead of fighting each other, learning how to deal with difficult situations and conflict, difference of opinions, different ways of how to, to resolve the situation, how do we form consensus because that's a really, it's a process, it doesn't happen quickly and consensus is not something that all of us are able to participate in because often we leave decisions to other people in our community. But because of the pandemic and because of the social media, a lot of us are now contributing to a, a global dialogue about 
how do we work together as community? How do we look at different countries? How do we understand different cultures, approaches to life and to this pandemic in particular? It's a really great opportunity to see how when you're watching other people's ways of responding to the situation, what can you learn from that? So healing can come from simply observing and communicating to others about the way that they do this crisis. It's not a big um, shift in consciousness, but it was like from my experience in hospital when I didn't like someone and I started to chat. I discovered things about the person that shifted my perception, my filter, my BS about the person, and it got me to connect to them through simple means. Where do you live? Ah. Oh. How do you get to work? Oh, what's that like? Oh, okay. Really? And it's a it's a curiosity that has got me into people's lives as well about how they do their life. Those sorts of questions are always going to be important and the way this pandemic is forcing us to look at how we do our lives is going to be a very simple way to communicate with people. And if someone's struggling to just get food, those are the things that you connect to them on. How can you support them? What is their struggle? What do they need? Those are the things that now we can start to communicate, which will basically be healing in itself. It'll just automatically start to heal perhaps old wounds in the community where people didn't care about each other. People were just thought about themselves. And when you start communicating and finding out about a person, you actually begin a natural process within us, like that neuroscientist that I can't pronounce their name is alerting us to. It's hardwired in us to take care of someone who's struggling. And that's in the video that I'm going to share in the description as well. He talks in much more depth about the, the wiring in the brain that we are wired to care. You don't have to suffer with someone who's struggling, but you can, through communication, by finding out what they need, you can begin to build a bridge and understand what they need, how to help them, and very quickly help them or refer them to someone else who could. So the old Piscean age would be to feel bad for people, feel like you have to help them, and feel guilty if you're better than that person. The Aquarian age is simply having a chat, communicate, find out what they need. What's their life like? Oh, that's interesting. How can I help you? Oh, I can't do that. Maybe I can throw you to someone else who can build those networks that the Aquarian age is all about without the guilt of the Piscean age feeling that you must lose something in your life. Just send them on to someone else that could assist. So there are my sharings on healing through our moving forward as a community, very different to what I had originally planned to share. And I look forward to any feedback that you might have and also any topics that you would like me to love Oracle on. Have a beautiful time.